Welcome to another edition of Kavanaugh's Corner. This is the Labor Talk Show here in Southern Maine on public access television. I'm joined this evening by two guests. To my left is Roland Sampson. Roland is with the United Paper Workers International Union. And to my right is Carl Leninen, the Executive Director of the Maine State Employees Association, members of the Service Employees International. And I want to welcome both you guys here this afternoon. Um, the, uh, the purpose of our show today is uh, to talk about an issue that is literally in front of the United States Senate uh, within the next few days, an issue of great personal concern to Roland and great overall organizational concern to, to Carl and to myself and I think to many people around the country. That's the question of workplace fairness, the uh, so-called uh, striker replacement bill uh, that has been kicking around the Congress now for a number of years and is uh, scheduled to be brought up for a vote in the uh, U.S. Senate uh, very soon. We're going to be talking about that, about the issue of uh, workplace fairness, but most importantly, we're going to be talking today about the issue of congressional gridlock. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask my guest to comment about that. Ron, let me start with you and ask if you would please for our viewers just to uh, give a little bit of background as to who you are, what, what you did, uh, and how it is you come to be here today. Well, uh, I'm from the town of Jay, uh, born and raised in, in fact, I was born on Union Street, Little right. Falls. Uh, good. And I like to say I was born on Workers Memorial Day, April 28th. Uh, but I went to work for International Paper Company back in 1965. I uh, spent a couple years in, in the service but I spent 22 years uh, working for International Paper Company until 1987. And of course, in 1987, uh, 1,270 of us went out on strike against International Paper Company. And within a matter of weeks, we're, we were all permanently replaced. Uh, the strike lasted uh, se uh, 16 months. And uh, we called it off after 16 months. And of course, uh, uh, here we are seven years later and only uh, 400 of our members have returned to work. Mm -hmm. So the company's only recalled uh, a third of the people mm -hmm. thus far. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so you are a, a, a former J worker, former J striker, mm -hmm. and you're one of the people who have been permanent, permanently replaced, not, not fired, but permanently replaced, right. and that's uh, really mm -hmm. at the heart of the issue. Carl, let me ask you to just talk for our viewers for a second about what's the uh, what is this distinction? What do they mean when they talk about permanent replacement? And why is this an issue right now? Well, under the national laws, um, workers have the right to strike. But the way the law has been interpreted by the Supreme Court, employers have the right to replace striking workers. And in the United States, which along with South Africa, I believe, are the only two Western countries that have this law, mm -hmm. um, our workers can be replaced permanently. Mm -hmm. So in effect, you're not fired. You theoretically have rights to a job but you've been replaced and you're not working. Mm -hmm. and the, the effect is the same as you're fired and basically you're fired for striking, right. which is exercising your rights under national law. So it's uh, obviously a major issue and it, it's one that it hardly smacks of any sense of fairness if you give people the right to strike but take away the right to strike effectively. Right, right. Well, I think that's, uh, for, for viewers, uh, some weeks ago we talked about this issue a little bit. We had hoped to be joined by Senator Cohen because he's somebody who's in a position <laughs> right now uh, to, to cast a very important vote about this thing. Um, I would say that uh, for, and I'm just guessing now, it's probably five or six years that this legislation has been, was first proposed in the Congress back in the late 80s. Uh, con then Congressman Brennan, actually, uh, mm -hmm. who represented this district in Washington, was one of the prime sponsors of, uh, of this legislation, which would simply, if it was adopted, as I understand it, would simply prohibit employers from permanently replacing people. That, that's not to say they couldn't operate their business. They could run their that's business right. with right. temporary mm -hmm. replacements like they do in Canada or any place else mm -hmm. where there's a democracy and workers have the right to withhold their labor and employers have the right to, you know, to keep their business running. But mm -hmm. at the conclusion of a strike that the, uh, the people who were the regular employees would return to their jobs. That's really what the issue you know, simply right. boils down to that. That's right. And for now six years, uh, this give or take a few months, I suppose. This thing has languished in Congress without having been uh, adopted without, and for the last couple of years, frankly, without having been voted on. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna turn our attention, uh, after we take a look at a videotape here, we're gonna turn our attention uh, 
to the process right now that the Congress is engaged in or not engaged in. The reason why this bill isn't even being voted upon, um, and I, I think when people learn a little bit more about how the process is working or really not working, uh, I think people will be angry about that. I think, frankly, people ought to be angry about it. They should be, uh, absolutely. So why don't we just take a few minutes. We have a tape uh, to look at that was produced a few years ago in the late 80s or early 90s uh, about the issue of permanent replacement, about workplace fairness, about this bill. Uh, unfortunately, all of the things that were brought up in this videotape three or four years ago are still true today. And so just to give our viewers a little bit more background about what we're discussing, let's take a few minutes and take a look at this videotape. This is called uh, One Strike and You're Out. Strike one, you're out. They tell us we have the right to strike, but they have the right to replace us, so actually we have no right to strike. And they don't have any initiative to negotiate a contract because they have replacement workers to replace you, and if you go on strike, they replace you. You know, it'll never happen in good old United States. Our government would never let them come in and take your job when you have a labor dispute. We were wrong. If they can fire us for striking, they can do anything they want to. Taking away those rights is like turning back the clock. That's not what America's all about. I would have to say that uh, without that right, you're just close to getting right back to slavery. Their names were Carnegie, Pullman, Gould. The same Jay Gould who boasted he could hire one half of the working class to kill the other half, and tried to do it. In the late 19th century, these robber barons reaped enormous profits from a booming industrial landscape built by working Americans. But American workers had no such power and wealth. They did have long hours, low wages, unsafe working conditions, and an absolute lack of dignity. The labor movement made gains, but workers were struggling against a stacked deck, stacked with the full power of the state, the courts, and violent private armies. It all changed in 1935. Then, as part of an effort to end the Great Depression, the National Labor Relations Act was signed into law, guaranteeing workers the right to organize and engage in collective bargaining, including the right to strike when necessary. The resulting balance between labor and management produced negotiated benefits that were extended to all Americans, including health insurance, pensions, safe and healthy workplaces, and much more. When bargaining fails to produce a result the workers can live with, the strike puts both sides under pressure to reach a settlement. Workers feel pressured by the loss of their family income, and the company is pressured by lost production and sales. All over the world, popular movements aimed at creating democratic societies have sprung from labor movements which depend on the fundamental rights to organize, bargain, and strike. In the early 1980s, that right began to be strangled in the United States. Today's robber barons, like Frank Lorenzo, have begun to exploit a 50-year-old loophole in American labor law. They fire strikers by permanently replacing them. Often, they advertise for replacement workers well before the old contract has expired. Firing strikers is not done in other industrialized nations. It only happens in the United States and South Africa, some company. Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, this is only one community among hundreds that have been torn in half by the firing of workers exercising their right to strike. For a long time, the Hammer Mill Paper Company was the area's biggest employer. In the 1980s, it was bought up by International Paper, a hugely profitable multinational company. Not long afterwards, 720 people were forced out on strike then fired. Their families and their community paid a terrible price. We really didn't want to go on strike. Um, 
actually, they, they gave us no choice. As far as I'm concerned, they put us on the street because we, we asked not for one thing. We only asked to keep what we had. For years, you did the best job you could, and then uh, it's just like they throw you away, like some worn-out tool. Emotionally, it uh, more or less has totally destroyed his self-worth. And not only his self-worth, but about 720 other people. Uh, families have broken up. Uh, one man committed suicide. And it's really ripped the town right in half. What I've seen happen is mental illness or emotional breakdown. The kinds of effects that we saw were just right across the board. There were social effects, there were problems in the playground, problems in the classrooms. Uh, there were problems uh, emotionally, you know, kids not being able to sleep. There were somatic complaints with headaches, stomach aches, uh, grades dropped. It really cut right across the board. My uncle, my pop, and my dad got their jobs, so I didn't like it very much. You could feel the, uh, the effect and the guarded, guarded uh, relationships uh, among people as they gathered for worship or for Christian education. It's very hard to talk about it because um, it destroyed my family. Uh, my sister also, uh, her husband worked at the mill. They've divorced. And uh, a lot of it's due to the fact that uh, the economic pressures of never regaining your employment. Um, uh, her husband started to drink heavily. Uh, myself, during the strike, at times, uh, I just felt useless. And my attitude towards life really changed. And it had a lot to do with the divorce. Well, my experience is that once you have replacement workers hired, it's very difficult. You take a, a, a situation that's already very intractable and very uh, contentious, and you make it far worse. You make it almost impossible uh, to settle the grievance. The firing of workers who strike has spread to many hundreds of companies throughout America. It's not just the big employers like Eastern Airlines or International Paper. A recent congressional report found companies firing strikers in fully 15% of all strikes, roughly 100 times every year. In Tennessee, a successful organizing drive was turned upside down by a company that refused to bargain a fair first contract. After the workers were forced out on strike, their jobs were taken away. You could uh, be standing at your press work and, and your nose would just start bleeding. I don't, it was caused from the dust and the chemicals and uh, the heat, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. but. We never had it checked out because we didn't have insurance to cover that. Any job-related health problem, they would try to say, well, you have to go to uh, so many doctors and you have to have so many allergy tests or whatever to prove to us, you know, that this and this is going to have to come out of your pocket. That was the most best freedom that I ever felt in my life was getting to walk out those doors like we were really going to accomplish something and doing something and looking out for each other. And I think it was a good feeling for the majority of the people because it was 90 cent, about 97% of the people walked out with us. But in a few days after we walked out, we knew that we were going to be replaced. And then we started to worry. See, I had to get a job as a waitress now, which waitress don't make any money at all. I mean, you could take from $6 down to two fifty three dollars an hour. That hurts. No job, no income. It ha yes, it's got a big impact on the family. The hiring of the replacement workers has really been hard on Josh because he knows his grandmother doesn't have a job anymore. And the money's not coming in like it should be. We cut back on food and clothes and be saving with our lights and our telephone. I don't think it's fair because she... It's fair because she um, lost her job. And they gave it to somebody else. 
Americans realize it's not right to fire workers for striking. When union members can be fired for protecting their benefits, everyone's health care, pensions, and salaries are threatened. And when union employers cut back on the health care benefits, that directly affects other people who do not have unions. They want to cut back, too. And it really erodes the way that we live, our standard of living. It puts everybody at risk. I could be next, you can be next. If they could cut back on union members, they can cut back on anybody. Even people like me, being a nurse, should be afraid of what the employer could do to us by taking away our health care. Cut the workers all the time, here and there and here and there, and not even give us a say, say, hey, you don't like it, you're on the street. And that out there is just not right. How can it possibly be fair to fire a worker because he's trying to protect his family? I really do feel it's un-American to have these rights taken away. There ought to be a law protecting people and protecting workers from losing their jobs because an employer won't negotiate a contract. Many in Congress share this concern. A bill to outlaw the permanent replacement of legal strikers has been introduced by Senator Howard Metzenbaum and Representative William Clay. The right to strike. The workers' main, workers main protection in the collective bargaining arena has been gutted, and it's time for Congress to act. A fair and balanced system of collective bargaining, which is the promise of our labor law, should not fall victim to the misplaced values of some who wish to reduce the standard of living of our workforce to that of third world developing nations. You can have a major impact on the fate of this bill by letting your senators and representatives know how you feel. Write them. If we can get this law changed, then America will be what it's supposed to be. There should be a right to fight for a better workplace. If we don't have this right, we're, we're not really living in America. This is America, and you're supposed to be able to stand up for your rights. How else are workers going to protect their families? They really did a job on me. They snuck up behind me, threw me out of work, took my health care away. I thought that in the USA, we had a constitution. I never knew they could do me this way. I always thought America was built on justice. We all stood free before the law. If everybody knows it's wrong to steal your money, why isn't it a crime to steal your job? To our jobs, you know it's right. We got a right. We got a right to our jobs. We got a right. We got a right. We got a right to our jobs. There ought to be a law that they can take your job away. There ought to be a law that they can take your job away. back. We just had the opportunity to look at a uh, videotape produced by the AFL-CIO some three or four years ago outlining the problem of striker replacement, how employers have uh, used a loophole in the law to essentially fire workers and steal their jobs when they exercise their rights to strike. Uh, for people who may have just turned in, uh, tuned in, I'm joined by Carl Lennon from the Maine State Employees Association and Roland Sampson from the United Paperworkers International Union. Roland is a uh, former striker, somebody whose job had been stolen uh, in Jay, Maine. And uh, Roland, perhaps you could bring our viewers up to date a little bit about where this legislation is now, because okay. we said it was proposed four years ago. Here we are in 1994. Yeah. Uh, well, Joe Brennan uh, sponsored the first bill in uh, 1988. Uh, since then, we've gained the momentum on the legislation. Uh, uh, last year, June of 93, uh, it passed the House of Representatives by a vote, I believe, of 239 to 190. Uh, President Clinton has vowed to sign this bill into law. Uh, we believe we have the Senate votes to pass it. That means we have at least 51 votes. But the problem is, uh, uh, when this bill is put on a Senate floor, it may never be voted on because uh, there will probably be a filibuster, 
as I has been for how many times in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the problem right now is getting the Senate, having allowing the Senate to vote on this legislation. Okay, well let me ask Carl, you, you spend a lot of time in Augusta and have spent a, a lot of your career sort of dealing with the politics, mm -hmm. uh, both at the state and national level. And perhaps you could describe for our viewers what, what's meant when Roland says we're facing possibly a filibuster. What is a filibuster? What, what's, what's going on? Well, under the Senate rules, there is unlimited debate. And either the debate just peters out because everyone's run out of something to say, or there is a vote for cloture. And a cloture vote takes 60 votes. So while to pass legislation, you only need 51 votes, a simple majority, to actually end debate you need to have a supermajority of 60 votes so that a minority of senators can block any piece of legislation from ever coming to a vote. So instead of voting up or down on a, a bill, whether it's S55 or any other bill, uh, on the merits, and, and you can tell where the senator stands on the bill, they can hide behind a parliamentary procedure and prevent debate from ever stopping so you never get to a vote. Okay, and that's really where we are right at the moment in the Senate. Mm -hmm. You said that there are at least public commitments. But most people we know where they're going to vote. The House already did vote in, mm -hmm. and just for the record now, how did our main delegation vote on this? Uh, as in far as in the House, uh, Tom Andrews was in favor of this legislation. Olympia Snow was against it. Okay, and so they both cast their votes, Andrews for, Snow against right. back last year. Right. Um, and. Senator Mitchell and Senator Cohen, where, where are they on the bill? Senator Mitchell is a co-sponsor of the legislation, and Senator Cohen's last statement, uh, as of last Friday, is that he will not uh, vote for cloture to end debate on this bill. Okay. So he, right now, is uh, uh, in Never Never Land, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so, so by not voting for cloture, that will uh, prevent the bill from actually being voted upon. Right? right, and that's the deal here. Right. Uh, now, folks, there's all kinds of talk about government gridlock and how the government uh, may or may not be working for us. And and uh, here's a case where I mean the issues aren't new. It's not a revolutionary concept mm -hmm. that maybe workers should not be faced with essentially being fired for exercising their rights under the law. Mm -hmm. uh, the the video mentioned the fact, and I think Carl, you had said earlier that. Uh, only the United States and South Africa have this kind of provision, and I got to believe that perhaps South Africa is about to change. I mean, <coughs> they've got better odds of changing, right? President right. Mandela <laughs> is probably uh, somebody, things will change. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but here in the United States now, we're faced with workers, uh, you know, here in Maine, you know, really having their hands tied. I mean, mm -hmm. if they've got the quote protection of the law, uh, they can still face the company being able to basically fire them if they exercise their rights under the law, right. uh, and at the moment, unless Senator Cohen can be persuaded to let the Senate vote, uh, we're not going to have a chance to, to move this legislation one way or the other. They won't ever vote one way or the other on the bill. That's right. Um, Which is what happened in 1992. All right. Tell, what, what do you know about that? Tell us. Well, in 1992, the, the bill was in, on the Senate floor, and uh, they started the filibuster, and uh, there was a cloture vote called, and less than 60 senators voted for cloture. So uh, the filibuster continued. Uh, there was an amendment uh, called the Packwood Amendment that uh, was introduced uh, a day or two later, I can't recall. And uh, that was debated and uh, filibustered, and another cloture vote was called and failed again. Mm -hmm. So the bill was pulled off the floor. So the majority of the senators in our nation, nation's capital never got a chance to vote on the bill itself. They just voted on whether to stop debate or not. You know, I just uh, saw a, a piece in today's newspaper that was talking about uh, the AFL-CIO here in Maine calling out Senator Cohen. I mean, I think people were realistic enough to know that Senator Cohen is probably not going to vote in favor of the bill. That's right. mm -hmm. I don't think many of us have any illusions that he's right. going to vote in favor of the bill. But the call to Cohen is to at least let the let the majority rule. I mean, that is, I think most people, if they were asked, people on the street ask, you know, what's the democracy mean? It means like majority rule, sort mm -hmm. of. Um, and and uh, mm -hmm. I think that the more publicity that's brought to this, I think people may see that this doesn't seem to be a very fair system. You know, it seems there's an inherent contradiction there that in order to elect a president, you don't need 
60% of the votes. You don't even need 50% of the votes. Mm -hmm. You only need to have a majority of the plurality. Right. I can never say it. Plurality of the votes. Mm -hmm. You have to have more votes than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So we can elect a president with less, right. with lower hurdles and right. equal, lower standards than to pass a simple law. Right. When you've got hundreds and hundreds of, of congressmen and senators ready to vote for. Yeah. So it seems like there's something wrong with the system. Yeah. This is an old, I mean, this, I don't, I'm no real constitutional scholar here, but the filibuster has been part of the Senate rules for, what, forever? Or at least, I, I think mean, it's since, 19, I think it's 1908 or something like that. Okay. It's, it's almost, you know, this century. Years, yeah. Okay, this century, all right. Yeah. And it's been used uh, in a number of occasions to essentially bring the Senate to a halt, right? I mean, well, what, what's interesting, in the old days when there was a filibuster, they had to actually debate mm -hmm. nonstop. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to filibuster, then you had to be able to stand on your feet and mm -hmm. um, carry on. Um, but it seemed that some of the changes and the attempts to civilize the Senate made it even more prone to filibusters. They have limited periods of debate each day. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you can basically come in for a couple hours a day and, and debate for a while and go home and do other things right. and come back and, and tie it up that way. And I, I would hope that it, if they try to filibuster this time, at least they force them to sit down and, and do a real filibuster yeah. and see how long they can take it. Yeah. If yeah. You, I believe it was used a lot less in, in the years, years past. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I read uh, the other day where the filibuster was used either, tw I can't remember if it's half as much or twice as much as the previous 50 years. Mm -hmm. So now instead of saving it for something special, they're using it as a tactic to block legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what in effect you have is a minority of legislators blocking the will of the majority. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you could have every, every, uh, everyone in the House of Representatives in favor of the bill, a president that's willing to sign it into law, and 41 senators can block that legislation from ever even being voted on. Well, that's, that's a, I think, a very frightening prospect for people as we sort of look down the road. We have now, you know, the, the Democratic president. We've got a majority, a Democrat, not an overwhelming majority, but there's a slight majority, Democrat members of the Senate, Democratic members of the House, but not, not two-thirds. And, mm -hmm. and uh, as we get into more contentious issues, I mean, this is not, I mean, this is a big issue among labor people. I think it ought to be a big issue among working people generally, but let's face it, it's not page one today. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other issues that are out there page one, and healthcare comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of issues, I mean, making any kind of progress, it seems to me, is really threatened by this system. Is that, I mean, am I the only guy who worries about that? But I, I don't think you're overstating it at all. I mean, you mentioned healthcare. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, if you have a minority of senators that oppose some provision and whatever ultimately mm -hmm. comes forward mm -hmm. as healthcare, they can stop it from ever happening. Mm -hmm. So then it's not just an issue being stopped that affects union members or affects people on strike, but it's only an issue that affects every single American. Mm -hmm. And here in Maine, we've had our own version of gridlock, this yes. kind of legislative gridlock, and it's had a very real and tangible impact, uh, certainly on my members, but in, in members of the entire citizen of the entire sure. state of Maine. I think, I think people probably remember uh, 1991, the state of Maine had the unique uh, um, notoriety of being a state that was basically out of business for a while. And Carl, at the time, you were head of, still were, was the, were the director of the uh, State Employees Union. Um, maybe you could talk to the viewers a little bit here about what happened there and why is that very, so why, is, why are you reminded of that prospect by what we're facing right here in the Senate? Well, you know, a lot of people have asked me, um, why does MSCA, which represents state workers and public employees of the state of Maine, we do not have a right to strike, by the way, so S-55 is not directly impacting us. Why do we care about this? Well, obviously, philosophically, we, we believe in people's rights and workers' rights, and it should be protected, and S-55 would certainly help. But it also sh is very real and frightening to our members to see legislative gridlock denying people's rights. In 1991, um, in a battle over the budget, and it was not a battle that was directly uh, related to the workers, to state workers, it was not part of any contract dispute or negotiations, but because of the issue of gridlock, uh, a Republican minority in the state Senate was able to prevent a budget from being enacted, even though there was a majority of senators ready to vote for it. And um, as a result, state government shut down, and you had 10,000 people thrown out of work for 16 days, deprived of the ability to do their jobs, to have to get their paychecks, to feed their families, 
The citizenry was deprived of services from the government, and it wasn't over an issue or a strike with workers. It was over political struggle, a partisan struggle, um, and basically a minority party mm -hmm. was able to use the rules to prevent the work of the legislature mm -hmm. from getting done, mm -hmm. to prevent the budget from being voted on. And um, it was obviously devastating and traumatic for our people. I mean, it's a small taste of what happens in the case of you know, strike or replacement, but I think it's a real example how here in Maine that kind of gridlock can impact the lives of, of tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Do, do you know, Roland, whether this discussion about the similarities between the state shutdown and what is really in effect happening in the Senate by not letting this bill come to a vote, mm -hmm. has Senator Cohen addressed this at all? Have you guys had any opportunity to talk to Senator Cohen? About uh, the similarities? Yeah. Or I don't think, uh, personally, I don't think I've discussed that, that part of it uh, because uh, whenever I I visited him. He's had uh, very little time to speak. I mean, he's a busy, busy guy running back and forth. So we haven't discussed that part of it. But after all this time, you must see the similarity between between these two yeah. problems. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I visited him two weeks ago. You did, okay. And he, he amazingly he found some time to see me, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the reason was quite simply he was intrigued as to why we would care. Right. Why would a public sector union that doesn't have the right to strike care about this issue? Mm -hmm and we tried to drive home to them, it's the gridlock. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the issue is important, and I don't want to minimize that, but more important you know, than for this issue or any other issue that comes down the pike is the ability of a small group of people to prevent the will of the majority from, from taking right, place. Right. And that's a pretty terrifying prospect, I think, for anyone in this country that believes in democracy and majority rule. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, it is more like what South Africa used to be, mm -hmm. where a tiny minority could mm -hmm. make the rules. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's a very unfortunate kind of situation, and I, I you know, we have, uh, you know, certainly Senator Cohen is, you know, widely respected and has been mm -hmm. in office for many years here in Maine, and and is the senior senator, and with Senator Mitchell's uh, retirement, is going to be the longest standing, you know, member by far. Uh, we had hoped to have uh, Senator Cohen on to talk with us about this in, in a show. We just haven't been able to work it out. He hasn't. Uh, I'm sure he watches our show every week, but he. Uh, but he hasn't been able to join us for one of these. You laugh. You may watch this show. I'll, I bet, I'll bet some of his staff is watching this show. You should show. watch the show. Uh, but, yeah. but really, I mean, the serious point is that we are at least having some opportunity to talk with people around the state about an issue that's not getting a lot of press attention. And we're talking about it from, from our point of view, in your case, from the very personal point of view of what happened to you and, and your family and your community in Jay, Maine, uh, and what happened to your members in Augusta, Maine, and really throughout the state. But what you know that's a prospect that hangs over the heads of all of our members whether they're union members or not it's sort of it's out there people know in the back of their mind that gee right now if they are forced into a strike never mind if they go out because the mm -hmm. you know maybe people think well they're going out because they're demanding higher wages mm -hmm. than the boss can pay let's talk about if the boss is demanding cuts which is what most strikes are about these days right. people know in the back of their mind that they can be they can be replaced, mm -hmm. uh, they can be fired, and, and that's a very frightening prospect mm -hmm. to most people. Um, sure is. So I, just, I think it's unfortunate that Senator Cohen is not, again, I wish he would support the bill. I think it's a good bill mm -hmm. to vote for, but I think it's really unfortunate that he's, you know, sort of, you know, I don't know, hiding behind is the right word. I mean, he's up front about it. He's saying he's not going <laughs> to vote at this moment. He's not mm -hmm. going to vote for cloture. I, I, what, what is, I mean, you had a, a session just yesterday, Roland, up in yep. Jay, right? You right. had a, maybe you should talk to people a little bit about that. What were you guys doing? Well, yesterday we, uh, in uh, the local 14 Union Hall, uh, we started a, what we call a vigil. It started at 11.30 in the morning, and we invited all the candidates to come to the Union Hall and to talk to workers, people that have to work for a living. And, uh, and letters went out to the candidates as, and also the uh, different locals around the state, and we tried to get the word out as best we could to please come. We invited everyone. And uh, many people showed up, and I think the majority of the candidates running showed up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really great. <clears throat> and one of the things that Charlie O'Leary uh, uh, to open the, the, uh, the vigil with, told the candidates to please shut up. Listen for a change to what people have to say. And I looked around the room, and everybody, they all kind of hung their head a little bit, uh, sort of like a uh, uh, sort of like a mother talking to his children, I, I thought. But 
Charlie's right. They have to listen to the workers. And uh, if they listen to what we have to say, maybe they'll sponsor legislation that'll be uh, uh, worthwhile to working people. Mm -hmm. But the, the vigil is gonna be a 24 hour a day vigil. We plan on keeping the hall open and uh, having people there around the clock until the vote comes down in the Senate in Washington. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Local 900 United Paper Workers International Union from Rumford, who, uh, by the way, had 347 of their people permanently replaced in 1986, are responsible for manning the hall today. Uh, we hope in the ensuing days that we have carpenters, uh, electricians, uh, more paper workers, whoever, mm -hmm. to please come to the hall and, and man it. But we invite everyone to come and talk to working people. And if you're a working person, please come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. I think it's about time that uh, rank and file uh, workers in this state and throughout the country start getting together and communicating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's, people are uh, asking me what the vigil is about. I think it's about getting together and keeping an eye on what they're doing to us in Washington. Mm -hmm. And if they don't do the right things, then we have to, we have to, uh, we're gonna have to do something. Right, okay, you know? well, you know, here's an opportunity. I mean, this is something that's been worked on for you know, a number of years, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, and unless the situation has changed significantly in the next, you know, matter of days, uh, if uh, Senator Cohen and other, uh, you know, primarily Republican, I'm not sure it's all the Republicans, but most of the Republicans in the Senate are the ones who are going to filibuster this bill, they're going to prevent it from being voted on, and it will, it will die. Right? I mean, we'll, we won't, uh, uh, we just won't have a chance to have this kind of legislation passed again this year. Um, now, I know there's been some talk about, well, the ways to compromise with these guys, and, 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 I, and I'm a little concerned. I have a letter that I got here from Senator Cohen, uh, his statement that he just put out the other day, uh, in which he talks about, and I won't read this whole thing, but he, he talks about the issue. Obviously, he, you know, he's heard from a lot of folks who've written to him, you visited him, you're, you have visited him, your members mm -hmm. have written, our, our folks have written, and so on. And uh, you know, he's saying, as of a couple of days ago, that he'd like, uh, he can't vote for cloture now, but he says he would like to see both labor and business reach a compromise that's agreeable to both sides. Well, that'd be great, but if we could do that, we wouldn't need the bill. I think. Need, right. That's um, exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just a very disingenuous way of hiding his position. Um, he's saying, well, if everyone could agree, then I'll, I'll support the yeah, agreement. Yeah, yeah. Well, the fact is that we can't agree and that there is a, a significant difference in the philosophy of mm -hmm. the business community, mm -hmm. which very much enjoys the advantage it now has mm -hmm. because it can go and fire, effectively fire strikers, mm -hmm. versus uh, the labor mm -hmm. community, which is trying to protect its right mm -hmm. that's supposedly guaranteed them under federal law. Mm -hmm. And by Cohen taking this position, he knows it'll never happen. Mm -hmm. and, and by hiding behind a filibuster in the gridlock, he avoids having to declare which side he's on. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an old, very famous old labor song, which side are you on? And I guess that's the question we ought to be asking, you know, not only Senator Cohen, but all the U.S. Senators. Mm -hmm. And it's a question a lot of them are trying to mm -hmm. duck. Mm -hmm. And this kind of fake compromise, exactly what he's doing is ducking the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to uh, pronounce that this thing is going to die. I hope it's going to be rescued well, some way. I think like it's to be I, wrong. I yeah. Love to I think it's a wrong. compromise when, when an employer mistreats you and the only stand you can take is to go out on strike and you deprive yourself of the wages that mm -hmm. you need to keep your family mm -hmm. going. And at the same time, it's supposed to deprive your employer of income. Mm -hmm. That's what's supposed to drive the two forces together to compromise mm -hmm. on issues. Mm -hmm. And then that's what's lacking today is, uh, you look at the, the giant corporations in this country, for example, uh, the contracts we have, a lot of them are individual contracts at different sites. Just like in Jay, we went out on a strike with a multinational corporation they were able to sustain the economic harm that was done to them by, uh, by us not uh, giving of our skills. But what does a worker do when, when a strike is over and they can't even return back to the job? I mean, there's damage done by loss of income to begin with. Sure. And sometimes there's other losses. Sometimes there's divorces involved and in other things. Right. And what happened in the case in Jay, uh, I think if we'd had the legislation uh, here prior to the strike, there may, there may never have been a strike because the company would have been more respectful of the workers than they, they are today. Right. And if we would have had a strike, it would have been a lot shorter strike, in my opinion. And no matter what would have happened, long or short strike, the workers that, that man that mill would have been back to work. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, we talk. There's a lot of talk, mm -hmm. certainly, that's coming out of uh, Robert, you know, Reich's department, Department mm -hmm. of Labor, and and uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, what some would call happy talk about how we are all going to get along and we're going to have this new, you know, era of labor management, cooperation, and and total quality, and all of the things that are going to be, you know, the workplace of the future. <laughs> And, and I don't mean to be cynical about a lot of stuff because I think there's some real there there's some truth to some of what's mm -hmm. being said. There ought to be able to be, yeah. uh, but but I I think that when people like us, you know, people who are you know represent workers and that's our jobs. When we're talked to about the new era of cooperation and how we ought to, you know, we have uh, you know more in common than separates us and so on. But when that's being said, yet the playing field is totally <coughs> out, you know. Mm -hmm out of balance like it is now with this strike replacement issue, it makes you feel a little bit like maybe people are just trying to scam you. Well, I mean, the reality is all of these things that, that Reich is talking about and other people are talking about can have positive impact, but it can only work. And it, it only benefits both sides when there's a level of trust and a level of respect between mm -hmm. the parties. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be able to look the other side in the eye and deal with them as equals. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you've got a tremendous advantage, which the companies in the private sector certainly have right now, um, where's the incentive? Mm -hmm. There's no need for you. You can get what you want by just forcing it and bullying people mm -hmm. and, and you know, abusing people. Um, so I think if you, if the secretary and the administration is serious, and I believe they are, about fostering more cooperative uh, labor relations, then I think you have to even the the strengths mm -hmm. and, and balance it out. I mean, it was interesting, Senator Cohen in my conversation with him, he said, well, this is a loophole that existed in the original legislation, so why should we change it? Isn't that what they intended? Mm -hmm. And I would just comment that there were a lot of things in the original legislation that had been changed as they worked their way through the system. I mean, at one point, the U.S. Congress felt that labor had too much strength, and in the late 40s, they passed the Taft-Hartley Act, mm -hmm. which tightened up a lot of the powers and rights that labor had up to that point in time. This is mere, now the pendulum has swung too far the other way, I think it's more than appropriate that you know Congress also step in mm -hmm. and uh, tighten up places where it's gone to excess. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they don't seem to want to pay attention to yeah. that. Well, this is just, I mean, the, the use of this loophole in yeah. the law is something that's gotten a lot of uh, popularity among businesses in the last, mm -hmm. what, uh, well, really since, you know, the PATCO, right? That's right. right. PATCO was the start of it. Yeah, that's the uh, air traffic controllers who uh, President mm -hmm. Reagan fired back in 1981, and that sort of set the tone that says, mm -hmm. "Hey, it's okay, you know, to to get rid of your workers if they're if they're exercising their right to strike." Mm -hmm. uh, and so, company after company, now big and small, have used right. this, or more often use the threat of it because that's we right. don't we have very few strikes in our industry. I must tell you, in the in the clothing industry, which is actually true in most industries for the most right. part. You know, most contracts are settled without strikes. I mean, it's something, you know, much less than 1% of all contract mm -hmm. negotiations wind up with any sort of a labor dispute or, or, or work stoppage. But it's always there. Huh? Well, I think one argument that is used is that, uh, or the other, I think our opponents have used on this, is that uh, there isn't that many strikes anyway. Uh, and it's the same with criminals. There aren't that many criminals around, but you need laws that will protect uh, the, uh, the victims, mm -hmm. and uh, not all companies will permanently replace you when you go out on strike, but legislation that we need now is to protect workers from companies that will permanently mm -hmm. replace you, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the good companies, what I call good companies, uh, this law is not going to affect, yeah. I don't believe. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit, again, about the, the process here, because, you know, the, this debate has gone on for five or six years about should uh, workers have a right to strike legally or not, and can companies fire them or not, and, and it, the will of the majority seems very clear. It's been expressed, the President, uh, the majority of the House, the majority of the Senate, but still no law, no protection for workers. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we facing going forward now? Let's, let's say, worst case, that there is no compromise, uh, that Senator Cohen and the others refuse to allow this bill to be voted on and, and it dies again. Uh, what are we looking at next year? I see a big blank. <laughs> it's going to depend, I think, on who's voted into the into the Senate mm -hmm. in the next uh, year or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has gone long, on long enough to begin with. Uh, it's been uh, five or six years. We've reached the point where actually we have the majority. The problem isn't that uh, what's going to happen next year. The problem is uh, there's a problem being created now because of the filibuster, mm -hmm. because of gridlock. Mm -hmm. 
this should pass now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a scholar of the Constitution, and I didn't realize till a short time ago that this could be done, that they could, they could block the, the vote in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And that really upsets me, it frustrates me. And I think if you look back at all the problems we've had uh, in the past in Washington, it can probably be, probably be tied to, this, uh, to the uh, filibuster, yeah. pork barrel politics. Yeah. So uh, I, right now, I can't see what's going to happen mm -hmm. next mm -hmm. year. How do you think this makes people feel about the political process? I mean, there's all kinds of people wondering, well, why don't people vote? Why don't they get interested? Well, I, I think it, it just, unfortunately, I think it just discourages them even mm -hmm. more. Um, people look and they feel that if the majority of the Senate is powerless, then what can I do? Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's exactly the wrong reaction. Mm -hmm. I think people should be angry. I think people should be, you know, mad as heck. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing if you, you know, elect a senator and they vote the way you like or you don't like on a specific issue, whether it's taxes or, you know, uh, health care or, or import tariffs or mm -hmm. anything you could imagine. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to judge them on where they stand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think but people get very, very frustrated about and they don't stand anywhere, right. and they stand behind procedures. And, and I would hope that people yeah. would be angry about that, mm -hmm. and that when they go to the polls, and when they talk to candidates for, con you know, for the U.S. Senate, they would find out where do you stand on the issue of filibusters? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to vote and state your convictions on the merits of a bill, or are you gonna hide behind procedures? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important issue that transcends many, many specific yeah. issues. Yeah, I would hope yeah. that it would be something that's talked about in the upcoming Senate campaign. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this, you know, we're now in May, and, and certainly this summer, the Andrew Snow campaign is, you know, for, to replace Senator mm -hmm. Mitchell is going to be big stuff. And, and I'm sure we'll, there'll be discussion about this bill, but we already know where they are. Andrews is in favor of, of the bill. Mm -hmm. Snow is opposed to the bill. We know where they stand on it. But your question, Carl, is where do you stand on this whole business of, of yeah. bottling things mm -hmm. up and not letting the will of the majority be expressed? And I really hope that, that this, you know, well, I think uh, if you look further in the statement that was put out by Senator Cohen uh, last Friday, somewhere in there it says that he's, uh, he's a, a proponent of the uh, filibuster because of whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> to me, it says that he's a proponent of minority rule. He says in there that the filibuster protects the interest of the minority. Mm -hmm. Well, in the democracy, certainly we, we, we consider the minority, but uh, when you take a vote, it should be the majority mm -hmm. rules. Yeah, I mean, there may be situations where, like, you know, for passage of treaties and, and mm -hmm. you know, confirmation, constitutional, constitutional, amendments, constitutional amendments, you need a two-thirds, and, and people right. understand that, but we're not, there's nothing here that's, no. this this bill doesn't rise to the level of constitutional amendment or anything well, else. Think, and who is the minority? But the important yeah. thing to keep in mind mm -hmm. is that this cloture rule of 60 votes is not part of the Constitution, it's right. not even part of any law. Mm -hmm. It's merely a rule that was adopted by the Senate itself, so it's a rule that can be changed by the mm -hmm. Senate itself. Mm -hmm. But ironically enough, in order for them to vote to change the rules, they'd have to vote for cloture on the debate to change the rules. There you go. So I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's sort of like a, a catch trap 22. catch yeah. 22 there. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's not even a law that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a rule they thought up yeah. themselves 90 years ago, mm -hmm. and, they, and they can't even get enough votes yeah. to change it. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the United States Senate has been looked at for a long time as sort of this exclusive millionaires club of mm -hmm. you know sort of you know white guys who get together and and I think in Maine you know we've been fortunate of having largely having members of the United States Senate who uh, had a great deal of respect um, you know going back any number of years mm -hmm. here you know Senator Muskie Senator Smith uh, Senator Hathaway cool. and, and through our current senators and. Uh, but from you know from other parts of the country, and I've lived in some other parts of this country, and it's you know I think the the Senate's image of being a rather privileged bastion of uh, you know of, of uh, rich white millionaire guys is uh, fairly well deserved. So mm -hmm. how is it that the Senate is going to you know change its uh, change its image if if they're really interested in having the democracy work in this country and having more people vote? Uh, don't you think perhaps that you know our senators ought to be considering how they look out there to people. Well, I think like everything changes. I think it's a, a bottom-up change. It has to be a grassroots effort mm -hmm. to see the change. Uh, I think most people aren't aware of this glitch in the in the uh, legislative process, and they have to become aware of it. And I think I would have to say that most people, maybe sixty percent mm -hmm. of the people, <laughs> uh, will agree that this is not right. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's about time that they know about this. This, this glitch and do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I think 
uh, then the Senate will have to respond and do something about it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the senators that are not in favor of this should be voted out of office mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and put people that are more progressive and uh, will help pass some laws that will do this country some good for a change mm -hmm. instead of tying everything up. Yeah. Well, we don't know how long this is. You know, this is, show is being taped on May 12th. You may be uh, looking at the show somewhere later <coughs> in the month of May. Uh, but whether this bill has actually come up to the Senate floor or not, I think it's important. I would encourage people to contact, you know, Senator Cohen and Senator Mitchell uh, mm -hmm. to let them know how you feel about the issue of, of strike or replacement, workplace fairness, but also how you let how you feel about this issue of gridlock. Um, I, I would go beyond that. I would also encourage um, the viewers and, and friends and family of the viewers to uh, contact the candidates and yes. talk to the candidates who want to mm -hmm. go to the U.S. Senate and find out where they stand. That's a very issue like great law. Yeah. This this does that this procedure does not exist in the in the United States House of no. Representatives. I assume it doesn't exist in the uh, main legislature. Am I correct? No, it, you know there's no no. They can close debate, but um, again, it's a question of the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and if you set up a rule, how do you change the rules? And in, and in the main uh, Senate, in the main House, uh, certain bills require two thirds, and, right. and that's where quite often the gridlock will, will come into mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a rule that they created, and it's a rule that they can change. Right. And I would say that whoever wants to go to the U.S. Senate to represent the state of Maine, mm -hmm. the people of the state of Maine have a right to know where they stand on the issue of gridlock, mm -hmm. and whether mm -hmm. those people who want to be U.S. Senators, whether they're willing to say where they stand on the issues, mm -hmm. whether it's striker replacement, health care, or anything else, mm -hmm and not hide behind a mm -hmm. college procedure. Mm -hmm. I think we deserve at least yeah. that. Yeah. I think that would be a good sort of question to be posed at a debate. I'm sure there'll be a number of mm -hmm. television debates sure. between uh, Representative Snow and Representative Andrews. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we might host one right here. Um, but uh, to, to put you know, four square on the table, that question of where are you on this, this gridlock issue? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Your members want to know that answer, right? A lot of, sure men, yeah. a lot of people in Jay probably didn't know about this until recently. I'm sure most people don't. They, mm -hmm. they haven't got the time to, to study all this, uh, this type of thing. I'm sure Senator Mitchell, I can't speak for him, but I'm sure he's frustrated in his efforts in Washington to get legislation passed because of this. Mm -hmm. And I just can't help but wonder if maybe that's a reason he's decided to step down. Mm -hmm. I mean, he hasn't said, but I, I can't help but wonder if, if uh, frustration has caused a good man to step down, or a good person to step down mm -hmm. from, uh, from office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think one thing might be useful for people watching the show to consider, I mean, almost anybody I know belongs to some kind of an organization where votes are taken, mm -hmm. whether it's a trade union, whether <coughs> it's a, a church group, a member of a church congregation, or a civic organization, or, you know, a charity group. There's, there's all kinds of organizations. Mm -hmm. And the people in this country pride themselves on democratic organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, we elect boards and presidents, and, and we make decisions. Just imagine all of the groups that do all this good work and all this civic duty if they had to face filibusters mm -hmm. in order to make decisions. Right. How frustrated people would be and angry people would be. And I, I submit that people would stop participating. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't mm -hmm. be willing to donate their time and their energy mm -hmm. for these groups if they found they could not even make decisions. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so here it is. It would be frustrating and devastating in a community like you know Biddeford or Portland or Bangor or anywhere else in Maine. Mm -hmm. Imagine at the highest levels of government, mm -hmm. you can't even make right. decisions. Well, you know, I think, Carl, that may be go to one of the reasons why people are increasingly apathetic about voting. They don't, they don't think it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get people to pay attention to elections because they have the sense that no matter what they do, you know, nothing really changes down there. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, by not voting on this, they're not making a decision. They are making a decision. You know, they're, by, by, you know, by uh, maintaining a filibuster on this issue, on workplace fairness, a decision is being made, a decision that says working people you know, you don't. You know, you you don't have any rights. You can't exercise the democratic but, right. But it is a decision that's being made by a minority. That's right. And right. imposing their will on the majority. I mean, Senator Cohen worries about minority rights. He doesn't seem to have any concern for majority rights. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, if you believe in a democratic system, then the majority must mean something. Yeah. And, and it, obviously it doesn't. Well, that's, uh, that's what we're faced with right now. And again, for viewers who may have tuned in, uh, we're nearing the end of uh, an episode of uh, sort of Civics 101 here today. We're talking mm -hmm. about the, you know, our rights as working people in this country, uh, the, the right of workers to who, who decide, who vote democratically that they're going to withhold their labor can be you know, fired essentially by their employers. And we're, uh, we're 
frustrated, I guess is one way of putting it today. We're frustrated that the U.S. Senate looks like they may not even cast a vote about this important issue. Um, in, our, in our closing moments, I want to thank you, Roland Sampson and Carl Leninen, uh, for joining me and ask if you have any closing comments here that you'd like to get out to our viewers this afternoon. Well, I don't know. I think we've said uh, pretty much covered the topic, but I did bring this prop here, I guess you want to call it. Mm -hmm. This is a list of all the people, not all the people, some of the people that have been replaced here in the state of Maine in the last five years uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, employees ability to permanently replace people. How many, I think names, it's a shame. How many names are on that list? About? There's probably 1,500 names on this list, if not more. And each name represents problems for themselves, for their families, and a ripple effect throughout the community. So uh, this legislation is not only a labor legislation, it's a community legislative problem. Uh, communities have been wrecked because of this uh, fault in our law, labor law, and it's time that it's corrected. I was asked yesterday uh, why I'm doing this. It's too late to help the people in the town of Jay that were replaced, or the, or the people in Boise, or Coles Express people, whatever. But it's not too late to prevent this from happening in other communities, not only in the state of Maine, but throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And it's a time to start doing something about it. Okay, thank you. And Carl, any uh, last comments that you would make? Well, I certainly would, would echo the sentiments that, that Roland has expressed, but I, I would also say to people that well, we would hope they would contact their senators and Senator Coleman, Senator Mitchell, and express their support for S-55, regardless of how they feel about this particular bill. I would strongly urge all citizens of the state of Maine to let their senators know they want people to vote. Mm -hmm. They want the right of the majority to vote on the issue preserved, and our senators should be forced to state where they stand on the issue and vote on the issue, mm -hmm. not on a procedure. I think even if they're against the bill, they deserve to know where their senator mm -hmm. stands, and it ought to be a recorded vote, and, and not something that's just ducked and, and uh, hid from. Okay, fine. And uh, I would say, just in, in closing, that uh, this show is uh, perhaps the only hour-long discussion about uh, S-55, workplace fairness, and the, the, the fact that our United States Senate is, is stuck in gridlock, and they don't want anybody to know about it. Uh, right. and, and we need people to know about it because right. it's not fair to working people in this state or any other state. So, Roland, I want to thank you for the work Great. you're doing thank on this you. bill. Carl, thank you for thank joining you, us again. And uh, thank viewers for tuning in to another edition of Kavanaugh's Corner. We'll be back again next week with uh, uh, more news and views from the point of view of working people in Maine. Thank you. And so uh, the strike uh, lasted from June of 87 until October of 88, uh, more than a year, 14 months or so. Uh, and the union was unable to overcome the uh, power of the corporation in, in no small measure because the corporation was able to go out and, and in fact did go out immediately and hire people as so-called permanent replacements, uh, otherwise affectionately known as scabs, to steal the jobs of the workers who were exercising their rights to strike. Yes. Sounding like a lawyer there, Mike. When I go to the union <laughs> meetings and refer to those people as permanent replacements, I get shouted down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, <clears throat> whatever they're called, uh, you'll know them by the slime they leave behind them, they say, right? Uh, no, no offense, really. Uh, in any event, the... Uh, one, one thing I would like to add, because that is a sensitive subject right now with the replacement work, and I think it's a, a ploy that corporations use to, to distract us. Mm -hmm. I don't think the worker should uh, spend all his time and energy focusing on the replacement worker. All the replacement worker is is a tool that corporations use to get our jobs away from us.